Hi all. Uh, it's very nice to see such a large crowd here today. It's always nice when uh, a lot of viewers show up for these. Um, but I want to say welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. If you haven't met me before, uh, my name is Brad Zdenek. I help direct the coil rig process uh, from beginning to end through this review period, uh, through the awards, and then helping to usher the projects on to whatever futures they may have. Uh, so I'm going to be your, your guide through this. Uh, you're going to receive a number of emails from me over the coming weeks. Uh, I am going to say thank you again and again and again. So let me start with by saying thank you for being here and for volunteering to be part of this process. Uh, we, we literally could not do this without you. Uh, this, this research initiation grant process helps to bring much needed seed funding to really good ideas here at Penn State. Ideas that have the potential to transform learning, to transform our university, uh, to bring added capacity to this university and for the learners that are here and the teachers that are here. Uh, and it all starts with this process right here that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we have had uh, 19 submissions this round. Uh, that's a, right around the average, maybe a couple uh, submissions light from what we normally get in this fall round. This is our smaller of the two rounds uh, in general, and a lot of that has to do with where uh, funding cycles run and, and fiscal years and the like. Uh, but we received 19 submissions uh, this round, and some. I, I was up until about 2 o'clock uh, last night uh, reading some of these submissions and, and looking through them, and some really cool and innovative things. Uh, being proposed. So I, I have a feeling you're very much going to enjoy looking through these and reading through these proposals. Um, I figure we, what we can do is we can start by uh, doing a kind of a broad overview of, of what the program is, uh, the way this process is going to work, and then uh, generally what I've found most useful is to actually walk you through uh, the process as you will walk through it. So basically from the point you get an email from me tonight uh, probably just before midnight of your review assignments and links to all of the documents that you're going to need from that point until uh, November 30th when these proposals are due, what you will do uh, in that process. Uh, today as we're going along, since we have a fairly large group, I won't be able to turn on mics for everybody, but there's a chat box over on the side. Uh, if you don't mind uh, any questions that may come up, throw them in the chat box. If I don't happen to see them, uh, there's an icon up at the top with a hand raised. You can click on that and it'll flash at me so I will, uh, I will see that you have a question popped up there. But I'll try to keep my eye on, on the chat and, and respond as, as quickly as I can. Uh, that's why I'm looking over the side. I have a second monitor over here. So um, let's get started. First, thank you. Um, this this process uh, has now been going on for nine or eight cycles. This is the ninth cycle of research initiation grants. Uh, we've we've funded well over 40 proposals to date, and those proposals have gone on to to bring in over five million dollars in funding to this university, uh, external funding, uh, ideas that have gone on to bigger and better things. But the seeds of those ideas. Uh, started here uh, in this process, in this initial round of funding to help them get their ideas built out, to be able to bring them to the NIHs, the NISFs, the IESs, the larger granting agencies, as well as some ideas that haven't gone on to those types of futures, but have gone on to be university-wide tools available to everybody. Uh, the digital badging tool here at Penn State, badges.psu.edu, being one of the most visible examples. Uh, that started off as a coil rig project and has now turned into a university-wide resource. Uh, so that's what you're part of today. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working together to look through these 19 proposals and ask ourselves the questions of uh, what, what's the potential? How good are the ideas? How, actually, more specifically, how good are the proposals? Do they align with the, the, uh, the objectives of the research initiation program? Do they have the potential for that larger future? And what's the breadth of impact uh, that it may be involved in a particular project? And those are just a, a sample of some of the criteria that we'll be walking through today. And what 
I try to do is I try to provide you with as many tools and resources as I can possibly throw at you to make this process easy. Each one of you, uh, which there are 74 reviewers uh, in total, each one of you will be receiving an assignment of four different proposals to read. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you'll get that in an email from me this evening. Those four proposals you will have until November 30th to read. Um, and we'll walk through the length of those and the sections and those in a second. But they're not, they're not very long. Uh, in general, uh, from what I hear, each one of the reviews takes anywhere from uh, 45 minutes to an hour uh, for both reading the proposal and reviewing the proposal and submitting it beginning to end. Uh, so you'll have four of those. I will tell you right now that if uh, there are any problems, conflicts, uh, scheduling conflicts, or the like, you think that you can only get three done, please let me know that in advance. Shoot me an email. Uh, I guess I should put my email address in here, although you should all have received things from me so far. Uh, but shoot me an email to that email address, and I'll make certain that uh, I assign you uh, as many proposals as you can handle. That's on the one side. On the other, uh, if you are very motivated or very interested or just get wrapped up in, in these ideas that are being submitted, uh, you are also more than welcome to review more than the four that are assigned to you. Um, this is a different grant process than, than you may use, be used to, particularly if you've, if you've participated in NSF type uh, reviews or IS type reviews. Um, this, is, this is Penn State money for Penn State people. Uh, all the funding for the rigs comes from revenues from World Campus. And what we're doing is we're reinvesting in the university. And so we take the educational mission uh, very seriously and we incorporate it into the review process as well. Some of the, the 74 reviewers, in fact, uh, j just a little under a quarter, are first-time reviewers, uh, ha haven't done this before, graduate students, um, junior faculty that, that haven't been involved in rigorous uh, review processes before. And so I help to, uh, we use this process a, as a learning experience for them as well. And uh, we, we control for, for that lack of experience in, in our review assignments. We make certain we, we pair up senior reviewers with more junior reviewers. Uh, but the, this, that's the kind of process this is. It's a little bit different than what you may be used to. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to give you uh, a look at what the, the proposers themselves saw. Uh, many reviewers in the past have said uh, that is very beneficial, it's very, been very helpful to, to see what the, the proposers saw. And so you should be able to see my screen right now. Uh, this is a COIL website, coil.psu.edu. And if you go to the uh, Grants tab, you will see a uh, call for rig proposals. Now I'll go there right now. Uh, this is the page where all of the criteria were, and uh, you will notice that it is very short right now. We, we hide a lot of this information as soon as the, the call has passed. But what I'm going to do is pull up the actual PDF of the uh, RFP as they saw it on our web page. This is the RFP, and it is going to be available for you in the materials that I'm going to be sending out to you tonight. Uh, and it covers uh, the, the, the full spectrum of what the request for proposals was. Uh, most of this you do not have to worry about. I have already done uh, compliance checks on all the proposals for uh, adherence to the word limits, adherence to the page limits, uh, checked over their budgets to make certain that they were not proposing uh, uses of funding that weren't in alignment or, or weren't allowable under this grant program. All of that kind of, uh, of uh, all those types of checks have already been taken care of. You will be focusing on the content of the proposals and, and, uh, and judging those by criteria that we've laid out. But as I said, very often I've heard from review reviewers that they like to see the, the overall perspective. Uh, so here uh, you can see funding. We've got a breakdown of use of funds, funding priorities, funding guidelines. Uh, again, you can read all this if you like. There's no need for me to go through it in detail right now uh, because it's going to be somewhat secondary to your, to your review process. Uh, the proposal sections. I will talk about this for just one second because all of your proposals will look basically the same. Uh, and this is the format that you will find in them. Uh, there will be a cover page. Uh, that should be the first page with some of this key information on it. You will see an abstract 
which is limited to 200 words. Each one of these following sections is limited to 200 words, extremely brief. And one of the reasons we do that is we really try to push the proposers to focus in, laser focus on answering that question to help you in your review uh, to, to really distill down what that idea is. So there's an abstract which is 200 words, but then we get into the meat of it. An innovation statement, which is 200 words. And this is the, the laser-focused narrative of why is the thing you're building innovative? This, if there is one place that both reviewers and proposers uh, have difficulty, have confusion, it is in this. And we will focus on, on the definition of innovation in a few minutes and, and talk about what's in this section. But innovation is one of the most critical and key components within this entire proposal process, or within the entire proposal. So you'll see that right up front, 200 word statement. An impact on learning statement, which is also limited to 200 words. And then an alignment with COIL's research priorities, which is also limited to 200 words. What those research priorities are, we'll get to in just a few minutes. Uh, a narrative, there is a five page narrative. Uh, so you'll see this is very, very brief. Uh, in fact, we're asking for uh, them to touch upon research questions, methodology in here. Five pages is very short for doing that. Um, so some of the proposals you may feel need uh, just a little bit more detail, and sometimes that is addressed in, in the supplementary materials sections, uh, but you have to realize that our proposers are working within this, this five-page section. Uh, so there's only so much detail and information that can be provided there. What I have always have encouraged the proposers to do in a similar webinar to this and in one-on-one -on -one consultations is to, is to focus in and be as succinct as possible in answering each one of the questions that you will be asking as reviewers related to these proposals. And that is all captured in a rubric we'll go through in a minute. There will be a page of references, possibly. I believe that every single proposal I saw last night uh, has a page of references. Uh, so you can get a, a, a bit of a sense if you're familiar with the research base related to the proposal. You'll get a sense of where they're coming from, where their foundations lie. If you're not familiar with the research base in that, that, is in, in that uh, area, it is not an issue. Uh, we are uh, reviewing these proposals on their own uh, as they stand. But for those of you who may be content experts, uh, it will help provide a little bit more additional information for you. There will be team bios, uh, which will tell you who's on the team and what can they do. Uh, there will be an estimated budget. Uh, this, uh, this is something that you will look at. Uh, this isn't redacted. This isn't pulled out of the proposals. Uh, you will see the budgets as they are being submitted to us. Uh, each one of the proposals uh, can uh, be a maximum $40,000 request. Uh, and one of the questions that often comes up uh, from reviewers and, and, and generally, within, within a couple days of this starting, uh, I'll shoot out my response to this, to this question to everyone. And that's that, uh, do we prefer uh, lower dollar item, uh, lower, lower dollar uh, requests so that we can fund more proposals? Or do we prefer, prefer larger asks that are uh, looking to do more? And the question, uh, the answer to that question really is, it depends. Uh, there's a balance to be struck between potential impact and the cost of, of uh, seeking that impact. And so that is where we put it in your hands to, to read the proposals, get a good sense of what the project is looking to do, and then judging this budget within that context. Um, so of course, if a $20,000 pr uh, proposal is going to have a uh, great breadth and depth of impact uh, by your judgment. And a $40,000 proposal is going to have a very narrow focus and uh, is going to have a very limited impact at uh, the university and beyond, uh, perhaps only working for a single course. Uh, then that is something to think about when thinking about the, the budget, is we want to use this money, which in the end, this is, these are taxpayer dollars and student tuition money. We want to use this as wisely as we possibly can. We are stewards of this money. And so we need to make absolutely certain that we're, we're spending it in the right way. Um, so when looking through these budgets, you, you'll be looking for uh, you know, superfluous uh, elements, uh, things that, that really aren't critical to the project that may be included. 
and and reviewing the, the proposal uh, in, within that context. So the budget is really just numbers. Uh, there will also be a budget narrative that goes along with that where the proposers have been uh, asked to expound upon what those numbers mean. Why are you asking for that? Provide some justification. In my quick perusal of the, of the proposals last night, uh, these budget narratives are all over the place. Uh, some are very, very short and brief. Uh, some are very detailed and in-depth. Uh, so you may see uh, many different types of, ex of narratives throughout uh, your reviews that may uh, cloud your or may uh, color your perception of the budget and, and its value. Dissemination plan, there's a one-page dissemination plan, which basically means how are you going to let people know about this project. Two letters of support uh, are required from their finance office and their HR office. Do not worry about these. Uh, this is something that you do not really have to concentrate on. I've already checked to make certain that they're there. Uh, for the few proposals that did not include them, I've already sent emails requesting those. Uh, so you do not have to worry about this. And these letters are not reflected in the criteria that, that I'll show you in a few minutes. And then there's a supporting material section. So this is tricky. You are not required to, to read through the supporting material section, the appendices, uh, with the level of detail that, that we ask you, you give to the rest of the proposal. Supplemental or supporting material section is really intended to be those extra things. Maybe they be uh, screenshots, uh, graphic design elements, uh, um, perhaps even results from pilot studies, uh, samples of surveys, uh, things of that sort that there's no place within the five-page narrative to include, but they are also not critical to the proposal itself. They are meant to be very strategically used additional resources to help explain to you or help you envision what the project is intending to do. So I encourage you to look through these uh, and every proposer I've talked to I've encouraged them to keep that supporting material brief. But we have had proposals that have had over 40 pages of supplemental materials. And I will tell you right now you are not required to read through all that. We do not expect that of you. The narrative, all the sections I've gone through up to the supporting material section, we ask that you give great attention and detail to. Supporting materials, look and see what's relevant. If it's short, please look through it. Uh, the proposers put time into including it. Spend a little bit of time on it. Look at the whatever images, graphs, charts, surveys, whatever may be included uh, to help you better understand what the proposal is but you should not triple your review time on a proposal because a, an enormous amount of supporting material has been added. Uh, that, that, that is not required. And, and it goes against the idea of the five-page brief proposal. So that's, that's the, the format of the whole thing. And that's what you'll see in all of these proposals. And as I mentioned, they're very brief like that. And we have had some reviewers that have asked if they could do more than the four proposals that will be assigned. Uh, if you would like to, you are more than welcome to, as long as you do not have a conflict of interest with the additional proposals. Uh, we, have, we have had some very ambitious uh, reviewers in the past that have done every proposal. Uh, I would love to have that kind of time. I am uh, expecting that you do not. Uh, so by no means are we expecting anything beyond the four uh, but if you would like to, if you just get carried away in reading these proposals, if you're looking to get away from your family over Thanksgiving, uh, more power to you. You are more than welcome. All the reviewers will have access to all the proposals that are submitted, uh, whether they are assigned to you or not. So, back to our page here. This Friday, or I'm sorry, uh, this evening, you will receive an email from me that will have complete instructions for how to complete your reviews as well as your review assignments and links to all the tools and resources you may need. Uh, that will be coming uh, as soon as I have them completed. I'm definitely before midnight tonight but uh, possibly even before close of business depending on how things go today. Uh, and the first uh, and most critical part of that email will be a link to a shared box folder. Uh, if you have used box before um, it, 
it should be nice and easy if you're here at Penn State. It's part of your Penn State Box account. Uh, if you're not here at Penn State, uh, it is just like Dropbox or, or uh, OneDrive or any of the other type of cloud storage platforms. Uh, this is what it will look like when you uh, click on that link. You will see a folder that is locked and not working. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, so we will go back in. Don't you love technology? We will uh, log back into that, and you'll have to forgive me while I take a second to navigate to where we're going. As you can see, I have a large number of folders here. You will not see all of this. Uh, you will have direct access to the folders there. You will see this uh, when you click on the link. Uh, it is the uh, the online version of the box folder. If you have your folder synced, uh, you may have it synced directly to your computer. Uh, but for most of you, you're going to be seeing this web version. There is a password to this. Uh, I cannot trigger the password uh, for myself, but the password will be included in the e email. Uh, it's the same password we use for everything related to this review process, which is coil rig, all lowercase. And again, that will be in the email. But when you click on this, you'll see this page, but there will be a dialog box up front saying this, pa this folder is password protected. Uh, please enter your password. Coil rig, and you'll see this. You'll notice that the folder is uh, broken down into two subfolders and then some materials. These materials are what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, these two folders uh, will hold documents uh, that you will also need. The proposals folder, uh, I've got most of them in here now, uh, but the proposals folder holds all the PDFs of all the proposals that have been submitted. You can simply click on these, you can read them online, you can click on the three dots here and you can download them if you, if you like. Uh, on the previous uh, screen, you can actually download the entire folder if you want uh, by clicking here and you can download the entire folder to get all the proposals on your desktop if you like. Uh, those are all available to you, and this folder will continue to be available to you throughout this review process. So the first thing that you will uh, go to, and I, I, what I try to do is I try to uh, label these in the order that you would use them. Uh, the first thing that you will see is a link to this training right here. So obviously this link is not active right now because I'm, we're, we're in this workshop. Uh, but once we're done with this, I will export it. I'll create a private YouTube video, and I will uh, link it here. So if you want to go back and listen to this at any point, if you're glutton for punishment, uh, you can click here, and it'll bring you right to that video. Number one, this is the RFP. If you want to go back and look at that RFP, see the way we described it to proposers to get the context, uh, you can click here, and you can see that uh, in PDF form. This how to conduct and submit reviews is uh, a largely a reiteration of what you will have in the email that I will send you this evening. So let's go ahead and open that up, and you will see. This is, this is not up to date. You will see this as spring 2016. It's because I'm still going through all the proposals and uh, updating the information in this document uh, before I send it out this evening. But this will give you a sense of exactly what it looks like. I'll try to give you step by step of how to go through this process, and that's what we're going to do right now. So first, all of your materials will be within this folder. There is a link. If you click on that, it will bring you right to where we just were. You will notice that it tells you that the password is coil rig. I ask you, please do not share this outside of the review group. Uh, I, uh, I, I do put in your emails in, into the box system so that we can track when, who, and and when you are accessing this information, uh, but it is possible for you to share it outside. Uh, each one of these proposals does include budgetary information for the proposals. Uh, some of them include salaries. Uh, this is not information that we want to publicly share. So I ask you as part of this process, do not share this information outside of, of this group. So there's a link to all the materials. You should have received an email from me as of this evening. Uh, if you do not, you can email me and let me know. What I am doing right now and what I'm going to continue doing uh, through the evening up until midnight is going through uh, each one of you and each one of the proposals and identifying conflicts of interest between them. It is inevitable that we will miss something. Uh, 
it is wonderful for those of you who are outside of Penn State uh, where we can avoid uh, many conflicts of interest a little bit easier. But here within Penn State, uh, this innovation community is relatively small. Uh, and uh, there are usually one or two steps of separation between everybody. Uh, and so it can be uh, very challenging at times to avoid conflicts of interest. So what do we mean, what do I mean by conflict of interest? Conflict is, of interest is essentially uh, any sort of perception that you would not be able to be unbiased in your review of the proposal. Uh, that it is an individual that you work with on a daily basis. It is a project uh, for which you have in-depth knowledge that others would not have access to. Uh, that would be beyond the proposal. Uh, it is a project that is led by someone to which you report in any way, whether it be an advisor or uh, a, uh, a superior or an administrator, uh, any of those types of situations. I will try to uh, head those conflicts of interest off up front, but if I miss something, please, as soon as you get your assignments tonight and you look at those proposals, shoot me an email and say, hey, I have a conflict of interest with the third proposal uh, you assigned me, and what I'll do is I'll reassign those proposals to make absolutely certain that, that we can avoid those conflicts of interest. And the same goes for if you self-select additional proposals to review. Please just be mindful of conflicts of interest. Uh, I'll also check those when I see which additional proposals you review to make sure on my end that we're comfortable with that. Uh, so uh, you'll get your review assignments. Then you'll find the proposals folder. I just showed you that. You can download all the proposals that you reviewed. There is a scoring rubric in the box folder. So let me pop back into the box folder really quick. You will see number four, rig review rubric for fall 2016. Uh, there is a review rubric that you will be able to use, and I'll show that to you in just a minute, uh, to actually go through and help you think about point values for each one of the categories. So you take that rubric, and then you will read the proposal that you just downloaded in, in step three. You'll read the proposal, and if you like, I uh, also are link. I also link out a little worksheet that you can jot notes in as you do your reviews, uh, to to just to just have a place to write down scores uh, off the top of your head as you're reading through notes, questions, and the like. Uh, you don't have to use those, but they're available to you, and I'll show you those in a minute. Uh, so you go through, you read the proposal, you jot things down on that worksheet, and then you go to this link right here where you submit your reviews. The review uh, criteria and submission form is online. It's a Qualtrics survey, uh, and you will go through, and for every single proposal, you will visit this link, you will enter the information, close it, read the next proposal, and then do the same thing again and again. And that's what we'll walk through in a minute. Uh, we'll talk about how to do the Qualtrics survey, but I'll show you firsthand in a minute how to do that. Uh, and then when you finish the review on that proposal, you close the Qualtrics window, and then you go back and do steps three through six for each one of the additional proposals you have. Uh, so that those are all the instructions. As I said, this is from last time. Your, your reviews are due uh, by 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on November 30th. Uh, so November 30th, 5 p.m., that's when we ask that all, your, all of your reviews are in. This is a very tight review process. Uh, from submission date to announcement of winners is, is basically a month, actually a little less than that, and that includes uh, doing the financial vetting that we have to do for budgets. Uh, so it is a very quick turnaround. The money will be in hand for the proposers January 1st. Um, so you can see that's one of the reasons why we have quick turnaround on this and why it's critical that you get those submissions to me by 5 p.m. on the 30th. Uh, that date will be updated in this form and in the email I send you uh, today. So let's actually do this real quick. Uh, let's actually walk through the process and, and think about how, uh, how we'd actually conduct a review. So let me go ahead and open up one of the proposals. Here is one of our first proposals. You'll see it drops us right onto the cover page, which has all the information. What I do is I, I take this, I look at it, uh, take a glance, orient myself to it, and then I would open up one of my first tools that is available in the, um, in the box folder. 
and that is the worksheet. There it is. Maybe it's not. Ah, here's a worksheet. Uh, so the one of the first things I do is I take this worksheet, and maybe I'd print it out, uh, or maybe I just use a piece of paper. It's completely up to you. We're not collecting these after the fact. We don't need them, uh, but many reviewers have asked for them and found them useful. Uh, so I take out this worksheet, and you'll notice on it that it includes all the different criteria and point values uh, that you will be going through in this review process. I'd have this sitting next to me as I open up the proposal and look at the proposal. Now, how do you assign points? What's the difference between eight points and four points in each one of these sections? Um, that is where the rubric comes in. So in addition to having this worksheet next to me, I would have by this point looked at the rubric. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time today, is what is the rubric? How do we decide what point values to put into that worksheet? And what do we do with them? So here is the rubric. Uh, you will notice that there are uh, 10 criteria that we have for these proposals. There is innovation. Innovation is worth 10 points. Enhancing learning. Uh, enhancing learning means that the, the proposal has a, has a potential to uh, create a permanent change in behavior, skill, or knowledge, in learning, the process of learning here at Penn State. And what we do in this criteria, uh, in this rubric, is we give you some questions to ask yourself. Uh, does a proposal have the potential to improve teaching and learning through an online innovation? Does a proposal represent an innovation that has potential for long-term impact teaching and learning? Uh, does it ha represent an issue of interest to the field of online learning? And then you can go through these, ca these columns here and start seeing, OK, the idea in this proposal is not related. Uh, fails to provide any evidence contrary to support the stated criteria. One point. Uh, the proposal doesn't even talk about learning. Zero. It's completely missing. It's not in there. Uh, in fact, there's a 200-word section. If the 200-word section is missing, zero points. Uh, all the way up to it has a strong potential to enhance learning, and the proposal gives compelling evidence to support that stated criteria. So I'm not going to walk through all these. You, you can read. But what I'll point out is that you'll see 0 points, 1 point, 2 point, 3 point, 4 point, 5 points. But this is a 10 point section. So what I have over here is a multiplier of 2. So basically, this, this is just help, to help you guide your thinking. Do not use this as a, uh, as a rule from which you cannot deviate. Uh, this is to help you guide your thinking, to help uh, provide a little bit of structure uh, to to the reviews that you give, and what we've found is that it has uh, helped considerably with iterator reliability uh, related to each one of these. So you'll look through, and you think it falls in the disagree column. That will be two points times two, so you'd assign it maybe four points. Uh, but maybe you think it just it's a little bit better than what's dis in this disagree, so you give it five points. That's up to you. Uh, this is again a piece of guidance for you rather than a set of rules for you. So the sections, innovation, enhancing learning, alignment with COIL themes of, of personalization and student retention. Those are our two themes for the year. Uh, so basically, uh, I'll, I'll go through details of each one of these in a minute. Uh, the R&D team is well prepared to execute the project. Applicability, cost effectiveness, feasibility, research evaluation plan, potential to generate subsequent research and funding, and dissemination plan. In a minute, I'll go through a deep dive on each one of these and, and what they mean to help you understand what these criteria are. The one thing I will point out is notice under dissemination plan, that is only a three-point section, so the rubric looks a little bit different uh, for that. But again, it is simply guidance. It is not a set of rules for you. It's just to help you in thinking these things through. So this rubric, rubric is there. You can print it out. You can have it sitting next to you. And when you're thinking about uh, putting a number into that, into that worksheet in the score box, uh, that rubric can kind of help you a little bit in thinking that through. But you'll notice that each one of the sections has a point value next to it. Let me uh, go through the actual criteria with you now uh, to help you understand what we mean under each one. And the one that I'm going to focus on is innovation this first one. 
it is one of the highest point sections. Uh, 10 points is the maximum that any of our criteria have. Innovation is worth 10 points. And I am going to, to read this one. I'm not going to read the rest, but I'm going to read this one because uh, we in COIL have struggled with the definition of innovation. Uh, it seems simple at first. Uh, when you start to dive into it and when you start to look through proposals uh, time and again, uh, we've had well over 150 proposals sent to us, and you start to look through these proposals and individuals' perceptions of innovation, you find that there's a large amount of disagreement uh, as to where the fine line is, whether something is innovative or not. So we have, we have refined and crafted a statement that, that we have in here, and that is that innovation is the research development or introduction of something new or novel. Let me repeat that, new or novel, be it an idea, device, approach, or anything with, with the intent of improving learning. The reason I emphasize new or novel is because this is where we differentiate our definition of innovation from many others. Uh, sometimes we get in an argument over whether something is invention or innovation, uh, what those two mean, what the distinctions are between them. Uh, but for us, innovation is something that is new or novel being introduced. And the questions that we give you for helping you think through this is, does it uh, represent something that's new or novel? Just said that. Does it represent an innovation that is not a refinement on an existing process, technology, or approach? Let me give you a couple examples here because this is this is one of those sections that a lot of people disagree uh, on. And when we have our reviewer meeting down the road, uh, this often takes up a considerable amount of our time talking through uh, as our reviewers disagree on this. So uh, an example, a non-example of, of something here, of an, of an innovation. So we had a, a wonderful proposal, great idea, uh, where individuals within a school of nursing were going to use uh, video, uh, uh, a live stream video conferencing technology in order to give just-in-time mentor feedback uh, to nurses in hospitals as, as they were interning and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and working with patients. And so the idea was that this was something that had not been done in nursing before because of many of the restrictions with patient confidentiality and the like, that this type of live streaming uh, for just-in-time mentoring feedback had never been done. So that was, that was great. There was, a, there was a solid statement for the benefit that that would have within nursing education in particular. But within the field of education in, in particular, just-in-time feedback using video conferencing technology is not new and it is not novel. It is a field that has been relatively well researched. Uh, it has been done for years. Uh, when, when I was going through my undergrad uh, years ago, uh, I, I was having it used uh, in, in, as I was doing my internship and my practicums. Uh, this, was, this is something that's well-tread. Now, it may not be in nursing, but it is in education. And so this is not something that is new or novel. This was a refinement on, on an existing process, an existing technology, an existing approach. It was just applying it to a new context. It was applying it in, in nursing. Uh, and it was having a slight refinement on it by introducing a, a few new restrictions uh, or barriers so that patient confidentiality could be maintained. Uh, that's an example of something that doesn't quite meet that bar of innovation. Was it a good idea? Yes. Do I personally think it should have been funded? Yes. Just not by the rigs. Just not by our grant process. Uh, the ideas have to be new or novel. They cannot be a refinement on something that's currently being done, and they cannot be applying that idea to a new co uh, an existing idea to a new context. Now, where, where the uh, splitting of hairs comes in is what's the difference between a refinement on an existing technology or approach and, and a change to an existing technology and approach that makes it wholly new. And I can't give you that answer. I can't sit here and tell you uh, this is how you determine it. That's why we're asking you to be at the table. Use your best judgment. 
think about the, the thing being proposed. Is it new to you? If you look at it, do you think, that's a new thing? Or, wow, that is a novel approach. If those are the words that come to your mind, you are our experts. We trust you. Give it those points. Give it that benefit of the doubt. Assign your points of what you feel comfortable with. And then most importantly, go to this comment section and type out what you're thinking. Write out what you're thinking. Why do you think this is new or novel? Justify the 10 you gave it. Or justify the 2 you gave it. Why did you give it that score? Why do you think it is new or novel? Why do you think it is not new or novel? In, in a sentence or two. Or, or <laughs> some people go on for paragraphs. That's fine too. Uh, but let us know why. And more importantly, don't let us know why. But every comment you write, every comment you write will be passed along anonymized, completely anonymized, to the proposers. You, uh, it, it, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in just one second as far as how these comments are being sent in. Um, that, that's actually in the review form in Qualtrics Online in a minute. This is just the place where you jot that down as you're writing it. Maybe you'll want to keep the website live and do it, do it in the Qualtrics survey live. That's fine, too. Uh, I'm just using this as an example. Uh, so every single comment that you write will be passed along to the, uh, to the proposers. Uh, we do not filter it as uh, some review, review processes do, where one person reads all of the comments, synthesizes them, and then gives a, an overview statement. We actually give the raw feedback. Many proposers will receive 15, 20 pages of feedback on their idea. And again, this is the learning process element of the rigs. We're also trying to help novice proposers, individuals who are writing uh, these ideas up for the first time, helping them to refine their ideas, uh, get that pushback, and make a better proposal the next time around. An interesting number is that 75% of the resubmissions uh, to the COIL rig process are funded on subsequent rounds. 75%. A lot of that comes down to this feedback that's being given here. So that's innovation. Uh, you'll, you'll think this through. You give it a score. Write a comment to justify it. Uh, and, and even if you give it a 10, let us know why. You know, let the proposers know what was the thing that stood out to you. What, is, what are you most excited about? Uh, and give that answer. Enhancing learning. Uh, does this I, the proposal impact uh, teaching and learning through an online innovation? What is an online innovation? Very broadly, an, an online innovation is anything that leverages a networked technology to improve learning. Uh, so this does not have to be something that is specifically applicable to online learning. You'll notice that we avoid that language in many places. Uh, it does not have to be specifically for online learning, but it uses an online technology. One example, we had a proposal in the past that used an Apple Watch to give haptic feedback uh, to residential instructor, instructors to remind them when to question, when to pause, when to reflect. Uh, that is something that, yeah, it could be used for uh, online instructors in synchronous environments, uh, but it, its real impact was in residential. That is fine. That, that watch was linking up with a cloud service in the background uh, and was provide, that's how it was providing that functionality. That is an online innovation. Uh, so you read those questions, enhancing learning. Again, you'll notice a 10-point section. Alignment with COIL themes of personalization and student retention. Uh, every year we select new uh, areas of focus for COIL. Uh, currently is personalization and student retention. These are big buckets. Uh, what are uh, student personalization, student retention? Personalization is, uh, is adapting and modifying uh, the learning process for the learner. Uh, and what is student retention? That is retention within, within a course, within a course of study, within a program, uh, within a university. Uh, so it's it, very, very broad. There is a specific 200-word statement in the proposal where the uh, proposer addresses this. Uh, this is usually not where many people lose points. Uh, it's pretty easy to have a proposal fall in one of those two buckets. R&D team is well prepared to execute the project. If you'll remember from the overall uh, proposal, 
overview, there is a section where there are team bios. That's where you get a lot of this. Read those bios, look at the people. Can they do what they just proposed in that five pages uh, based on the people that are on the team? Uh, so a great concern I would have is if it is a development project uh, where they're actually going to be creating an app or a program or a system online and they don't have a developer anywhere on their team. Uh, they, they may not have a database person anywhere on their team uh, and it's not in the budget. Uh, that would red flags all over the place for me. So those are the types of things you need to be looking at. Uh, there's five points for this section. Applicability. So this is looking at the potential for these projects. So it's great to solve a problem in a specific course or a specific offering of a course. But what we're looking at is what types of projects can we fund that have broader applicability outside of the context of a specific course or a course of study or, or uh, even section. So is this idea applicable beyond the context that is being uh, described inside the proposal? That's five points. Cost effectiveness. You look at the budget. You look at the potential impact. Is it cost effective? Are, there a, are they asking $40,000 to do something that you feel strongly could be done for 10? Are they, uh, are, they look, are they using the money within the budget in an appropriate manner? Or does it seem as though they are putting 90% of their budget to dissemination uh, when most of the money should be spent in development or refinement of a product? Uh, so what is the cost effectiveness of it? Seven points there. Feasibility. Can they do it? Uh, if you are proposing to develop a new uh, tool, on, online learning tool, uh, and, uh, and pilot it with multiple courses, and research that, do data analysis, and report on a, out on it in the course of a, of a one-year grant, uh, that is not extremely feasible. So what you're going to be doing is reading the proposal, looking at the team that's there, which, which plays into this feasibility uh, component, and looking at, can it be done for the amount of money that they're asking and in the time that's allotted? There are timelines in each one of these proposals. They can go from 12 months to 18 months, but the proposers were highly encouraged to keep it within 12. The money is actually available, available for 18, but uh, because of red tape, uh, processing costs and the like, you need a little buffer on each side. Uh, but can the project be done? Is it feasible? Research and evaluation plans worth 10 points. If you are an NSF reviewer, if you are an IES reviewer, if you're a reviewer for the NIH, these grant, big grant programs, uh, you need to scale back expectations for this, this section. What we are looking for is we are looking for a uh, solid evidence that there is a plan. But in five pages for the entire narrative, you are not going to be able to get down into the nitty gritty of the research and evaluation plan. Mostly what you're going to be able to do is provide what the research questions are, which is critical, and, and all of these should have either research or evaluation questions. So does it have those questions, and does it give some sense of the sampling that's going to be done, or, what, or even population that, that's going to be involved? Um, those types of questions. If those base questions are, are, are answered, you don't have to worry too terribly much about the nitty-gritty of the methodological approach for the research or evaluation. Get a sense whether or not they uh, have a plan, have put something together. We will worry about, after funding, we will worry about the nitty-gritty of the actual, uh, whether the methodology is appropriate or not, uh, and what the details of that, uh, of, of that are. Uh, don't worry about it within, within this section. Broad strokes uh, for this. Potential to generate subsequent research and funding. Like I said, these are seed projects. Uh, so the intention is for these projects to go on to something bigger after they're done with the rigs. So what's the potential? Uh, many proposers are going to include specific grant programs that they are thinking of, of, uh, of submitting to that will give you a sense of what that potential is, but also use your expertise to figure that out. And then finally, dissemination plan for three points. How are you going to let people know about this project? Uh, and it's a, a small point section, but
but most of our proposers, uh, proposals either are funded or not funded based on a difference of two or three points. Uh, so this can be important. Uh, so there's that. So that's the worksheet. It's the rubric that you'd use for helping to determine the actual point values in each one of those sections. Um, and you open back up our instructions. And what I'll show you now is the place you actually do it. So you've printed off your proposal. You've got your rubric sitting there. You've got your worksheet that you've been jotting notes down on. Then you go to our Qualtrics survey. And, oh. Sorry, I'm going to have to uh, with me for a second. I thought that was the updated link. It is not, uh, but I will get us there in one second. So there we go. This link, as I said, will be in, there we go. This link will be in the email that I will send you. So you will come to the survey. It will ask you again for a password. As I said, it is coil rig, uh, and that is also in the instructions. So once you do that, you click on the forward, and you'll get to the first step. First, identify yourself. You should all be in here. Uh, I will go down to myself. Name the reviewer, enter yourself, and then click on which proposal you are reviewing in, in this round uh, through, the, through the tool. Uh, there is a test if you just want to try it out. You can click on that and move forward. And then it asks you, look familiar? It should. This is exactly what is both in the worksheet and in the rubric uh, and was in the RFP. You will notice that everything is grayed out at the moment. Even if you want to assign this section a zero, you must click on the time on the uh, on the scale here in order to activate it and actually have it uh, enter in as a zero. Then you can give it whatever point value you want. You have uh, full availability uh, to do whatever level you want between zero and the maximum allotted for that section. And then you have the comment section, and this is. Jacob, to your, to your question, this is where we collect all of that information. The worksheet's just a place for, to, for you to write it down as you're doing the reviews. If you want to do the reviews live in the, in the forum here, that's fine too. Uh, this does save your progress uh, in cookies, so as long as you come back to it on your, on your com same computer, it will, your progress will be saved, uh, so you can definitely do that. But we ask that you give it a number value, give it a comment, and then move on to the next. And you will notice all of these are familiar, and we go through, and this is also, I, I can't imagine why you would want to, uh, but if you want to do this on mobile, you can also do this on mobile. Uh, this is a mobile-friendly uh, form. So you can go through, put all of your values, they align perfectly with what we just went through. And as we get to the end, research evaluation plan, And as we get to the final one, dissemination plan is our final criteria that you saw in the rubric and in the, uh, and in the worksheet. You click on that, you will see a question that is not in the worksheet nor anywhere else. And this is something that we've been adding, which is we're only going to fund three proposals. Uh, so, so there are going to be uh, probably 16 to 17 proposals that are not funded this round. They're probably really good ideas. They just didn't quite make the cut for this program, or they're just slightly out of alignment with what the rigs are. But we still feel that it's our job to help these ideas take the next step, even if we're not that next step. And so what I ask here is, can you think of anywhere or any people that that project team should be connected with? So say it's uh, somebody who is doing work in augmented reality and virtual reality, uh, but they don't have Conrad Tucker and Alex Klippel here at the university, two of the, the movers and shakers in AR and VR. They don't have them anywhere listed in their proposal. Here you'd come in and you type in 
you know, these this team should reach out to, to Alex Klippel and EMS and should reach out to Conrad Tucker and Engineering and talk about it. They've got labs related to AR and VR. And then click forward and submit. And we will take that information. And when I have a de debrief meeting with all the proposers after this process, I'll give them that information uh, so that hopefully they can find some alternate ways of moving their project forward. So I click that and you'll notice here, this says you are almost done. You need to click one more time to finish your review. So you click that last button and thank you for time spent taking the survey. Your response has been recorded. You can close that window. If you're ready for the next one, you can go back into the proposal, into the review, or I'm sorry, into the Qualtrics form and you start all over again right at the beginning and you pick the next proposal that you're reviewing. And then you do that four times and you are finished. Um, that's the process. Uh, that's really it, beginning to end. Uh, we will uh, go through all of this uh, up until the 30th. We will have our meeting on December 5th. Uh, I've sent that out in a, a couple notes to you, but December 5th at 3 o'clock, what we will do is we will bring together everyone who uh, who reviewed any of the top 10 proposals and we will have an opportunity for everybody to talk those through, modify their scores if they feel necessary, uh, and essentially set in stone what the final scores are. What happens from there is that we will take your suggestions, your recommendations, uh, your scores, and I do some basic, basic statistical analyses on those. I, I look for outline scores, which are two standard deviations from the mean. We eliminate those scores. We look at how that changes rankings. Uh, but we get a basic ranking of the scores, and we take those rankings to the director's table. The eight of us sit down, and then uh, the eight uh, co-directors and I uh, sit down, and we decide on uh, finally which proposals we're going to fund. We try to stick right in line with what the reviewer suggestions are. There are times that we deviate, uh, but for the most part, we stick right in line with what you suggest. And when we do deviate, what it means is that... Um, so, for instance, the second, the, the, we're funding three, the, the proposal that is third ranked for, based on your scores is a tenth of a point off of from four, and we like four better. We think four has a greater potential for impact. We'll bump it up to three and, and flip-flop them. Uh, those are the types of modifications we make, very uh, minor changes. Uh, but in the end, the director's group has a final say on, on what's funded and what's not. So... That's the whole thing, beginning to end. Uh, I am here uh, for you throughout this entire process. Uh, again, I will have this in the email. Uh, that is my phone number. It rings me uh, anywhere I am. You, you will find me. It forwards to my cell phone. It's here in my office. Uh, I will be answering that phone from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. Eastern Time uh, for the length of the review process. Uh, so if, when you need to call me, please do so. If you want to email me, email me. I will get back to you as fast as I possibly can. And I will be here to answer any questions you have throughout the process. Uh, it will all kick off tonight uh, when I send that email. And then whenever you get a chance to actually begin reading these uh, proposals uh, and, and doing the reviews. You'll get a couple prompts and reminders from me along the way just uh, because I know we'll all get distracted by... Uh, by the holiday, by Thanksgiving, and, and, and travel and all that. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to remind you as you go along so that we don't have all the reviews coming in on, on the 30th. Uh, although the, that, that part of being a student never quite leaves any of us. So uh, anything I can do to help, I am more than willing to do so. Uh, I don't see any questions uh, that have been coming up in the, in the chat box. Uh, so I will just say that I am available from here on out if you need anything. Hopefully this has been, has been helpful to you. All of the tools, all of the instructions, all of that will be available to you uh, very shortly in an email that I will send out. So I will finish by saying thank you. Couldn't do this without you. You'll be hearing a lot from me over the next coming few weeks, uh, and I will be here in any way I can be for you. Thank you very much.